and to get to know one another and to have conversations and to see what the effect was uh, on, on their work. Um, and so these uh, uh, evenings are in a way the heart of what we do because they are the moment in which we have the opportunity to hear uh, the work that is going on at the Institute and to interact with it. Um, so let me say something about Joao Pina, who is the Abigail, or one of the Abigail R. Cohen Fellows at the Institute this year, um, who is a photographer, and he's a graduate of the International Center of Photography. He's a former Neiman Fellow of Harvard University. His work has been shown uh, in cities on both sides of the Atlantic and in both hemispheres, and North and South. Uh, he's been commissioned to do work that's appeared in the Washington Post and recently in the National Geographic there was a fantastic series uh, on the beginnings of the lockdown in an enormous apartment complex uh, in Sao Paulo if yes. I remember um, and he's also the author of four books of three, three. Uh, am I right three, three. four is going to fourth be is one. coming <laughs> the, fir the first of which but maybe it has a kind of connection in a way, the first with what we're going to, to be listening to tonight, because it was um, built around the experiences of a generation of Portuguese political prisoners. Um, uh, and then there was a book about uh, uh, the South American military counterinsurgency and repression operation, Operation Condor. Uh, and then there was a wonderful book uh, about the effect, well it was, ar it was around, if I remember, the, the, the effect of the Olympic Games on the transformation of... Yeah, while the, the Olympics were being prepared. While, on, on the urban fabric of Rio and, and Brazilian urban life. Uh, the only other thing I want to say is, is the impression that your work has made on me personally. Uh, because I remember very vividly when, when uh, I saw it for the first time in the context of reading through your application and then uh, and, and then lo looking into it more, uh, it, it's, I think it's very remarkable, very distinctive, brilliant um, photography. Uh, it, it's very humanistic, it's not sentimental at all, uh, and it combines two things that very few people do, I think. Uh, at least for me, there's a kind of, there is a kind of mystical dimension to it at some level, and then there's a very sharp political sensibility that perhaps we will hear more about today. So Joao is going to talk about his current project, uh, which is through the experiences, I think among others, of some of his family members of his grandparents' generation, of a little known concentration camp in the colonial Portuguese system, Tarafal. Uh, he's going to talk for about 45 minutes, and then there'll be an opportunity for questions. So enough from me, I hand over to you, Joao. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. It's actually really good to, uh, today is the first time that I see Mark in person. I was th starting to think he was an avatar or something like that. Because for, a, uh, since January, I only see him in the screen. So it's very hard to, not like he's much taller than I had imagined. And it's, <laughs> it's very interesting, these this little things uh, that we all learn. Uh, so again, thank you everybody for being here. Thank you to Mark, to Marie, to... James and Eve for putting this together. It's been really, really a, a great opportunity for me to be here. And just a brief introduction, and I'm just going to give this away as a form of presentation that is definitely not academic, uh, but just to talk about me, where I'm at, and what brings me here, basically. So some of you might know where Portugal is. It's this very <laughs> tiny country in the edge of Europe, actually one of the oldest borders of Europe. And the interesting thing and why I'm showing this is this is our current map and what used to be our, uh, sorry, what used to be our map in 16th century Portugal was this. What's the big problem between these two maps for me is that actually these are being, built, being taught as this is what we were, used to be and without any critical reference to what this means, which is colonialism, our heavily influence in slavery around the world. And so these are still being taught to 12-year-old kids, this exact map, and no, not much of a reference. And why am I doing this reference? Because 
As some of you might know, Portugal had a 48-year dictatorship during the 20th century, which was actually the longest dictatorship in Western Europe. And it was built upon this idea that we were once great and all of this that is still being taught to us in history class. And we were particularly known for the three Fs. And if you think of Portugal today, what comes to mind? The religious people will know Fatima, the whole lady of Fatima. The more sports oriented people will know this guy. And the more cultural related people will know this woman, Amalia Rodrigues. So we were known for the three Fs, Fatima, football and Fado. And if you ask me, way more important than that, it's this. <laughs> These are the true export items that Portugal has to offer, the famous custards. And personally speaking, I think they're way more relevant than the previous three. But uh, I'm just making it this, this large note to sort of make you understand where I grew up. And I grew up in a country, I was born in 1980, the Portuguese Revolution, where the 48-year dictatorship felt what happened in 1974. So I'm actually part of the first generation of people who were born and raised with democracy, free speech, freedom of the press. And part of that also came with this clicker is so up. Part of that it actually came with this strange, which I guess it's common to a lot of places when they change regimes, which is how do you talk about what happened recently? And I remember very vividly when I was growing up in my history classes, they were all very like focused on that previous past I was referring and not so much about 20th century history of Portugal, which is a very particular issue to me for a simple reason that I will try to explain a little better. But the fact is that whether we like it or not, Portugal exerted an influence over big parts of the world for a long time, the longest time in Africa, in what is now known as Cape Verde, Guinea-Bissau, Mozambique, São Tomé and Príncipe and Angola. And those countries have only, they're actually the latest ones being independent uh, from their colonizers in the 70s. And in one of these, which is Cape Verde, it's a small archipelago in front of Senegal, for people who don't know where it is. And there was a very small island, which is the main island, called the island of Santiago. And on the north side of that island, there's a village called Tarrafal. And Tarrafal is surrounded by, by mountains and water. And so in 1936, actually Salazar, our dictatorship, who by the way was voted in 2007 by the majority of Portuguese in a TV show, has the most important figure of 20th century history in Portugal. So the most relevant person was actually our dictator. Uh, he sent someone to Germany in 1936 in order to see how Hitler was actually building camps, concentration camps, to put people and to put prisoners in. And so he sent, him to Ger he sent one guy to Germany and upon his return, he actually wrote a memoir explaining how the things were being done in Germany and how they should be done in Portugal. And Salazar actually implemented that, that uh, project in this small island, in this small uh, village, uh, and they built two kilometers away from the village a concentration camp, which is this image that you can see. And that, uh, that camp opened in 1936 and remained open non-stop until 1954. Why is this particularly relevant? For Portugal, a small country in Europe that was on the side of the, well, was obviously run by a fascist, fascist regime, neighboring Spain during the, the civil war in Spain from 36 to 39, being non-committed uh, to the Second World War, meaning doing business with the Nazis and with the Allied forces, welcoming Jews to leave, um, to leave uh, Europe, to the United States, to Brazil, to Argentina, but also doing business with Hitler and selling them material for the weapons. So 
Salazar was very smart, we can say that way, of remaining neutral. He did a lot of money with it. And at the same time, he had this concentration camp going for political prisoners, mostly anarchists, communists, and other smaller organizations were present in the camp. And this ran through, as I just said, the civil war in Spain, the Second World War. And in 1945, when the Second World War ended, the foundation of the United Nations, Red Cross, international pressure, conditions were a little bit eased in the camp, although they were still pretty hectic. And I'm just going to be talking and showing some of these images and then I'll pause on some of them to explain what you're looking at. But so the, the camp actually ran uh, in various different conditions, very hard conditions, very harsh conditions, especially at the beginning, people had no quarters to live. They had to build their own living conditions. The water was extremely salty, so a lot of people died in the camp for several diseases, include, including non-potable water-related diseases. And so this is how things were being run, and this is how for the longest dictatorship in Europe, or in Western Europe, I should say, uh, how they chose to send away its most relevant or most problematic political prisoners to get them out of circulation and hopefully to have them dying there. And what I say, hopefully having dying there, the Tarrafal was known as the Camp of Slow Death. And by Camp of Slow Death means that 300 Portuguese were sent there between these two years. And about 10% of them died in the camp. Uh, from those 10% who died in the camp, an extra 20% died in the two years after they returned from the camp. So from related diseases from, the, from this this stay in the camp. Uh, so let's say that one third of the population of Tarrafal died directly because of the conditions in the camp. So it was not an extermination camp as we often think when we mention the word of concentration camp, but it was a, a place where people were being sent, put away and hopefully do not return. So why am I pausing in his image and is actually the image that you have in front of you if, or under you if you sat on top of it. Uh, but this is an image of my grandfather, uh, Guilherme da Costa Carvalho, who at the age of 28 was sent to the camp and he, in 1949, and he remained in the camp for 20 months. We must explain that in 1949, so after the Second World War ended, uh, conditions in the camp were actually a lot better although he caught malaria in the camp and he was sent to the, it's known as the frying pan, which was the disciplinary cell, basically four big blocks of, of um, cement with a, um, a tin rooftop, which in the middle of the, a tropical place pretty much fries you inside because there's no ventilation. You're inside with temperatures between 50 and 60 degrees. And that's what punishment looked like there. And this image, is, or this image of a guy smiling in a concentration camp is actually not what we have in mind when we actually mention a concentration camp and political prisoners in the concentration camp. But why is this the case? Because this couple, which actually are their parents, or my great-grandparents, went twice to Tarrafal in 1949 and 1950 because of the conditions in the camp were a little better, so they were allowed in, and they were the only families allowed in the camp during the, 16, the 19 years of operation of the camp. And they had a very interesting mission that they decided to bring up on themselves, which was to photograph all the living prisoners and all of the graves of the people who passed away. So they could, upon their return to mainland Portugal, deliver these images to the families who some of them haven't heard any news for the last 16 years. Uh, so it was interesting how they jump into what is today very well known as our own privilege to bring these images and bring news to the families who in some cases they actually became friends for the rest of their lives. And this is actually part of the work that I'm doing, is to try to identify who are they, 
wh what were their stories? Where are their families? And what are they doing now? And so how, how are these things happening as of 70 years later? Uh, and to me, it's absolutely extraordinary the way these portraits were done and the dignity that are in these portraits are, to me, absolutely stunning. If you would tell anyone this was made around the corner and not four or five thousand kilometers away from where we're standing, I would believe it. But it is, was actually photographed inside of the camp. And those are the, the portraits for the families, you know. So they went to their place where they had their things stored and they dressed up and they, they tried to look the best they could uh, or the funniest they could and we get, we're going to get there in a second in order to look well for their families. Uh, so to me this is where the a really interesting um, aspect of this story lays is the fact that they were able to go to the camp because they could afford and they, they had the right connections to do it but also they didn't forget the pain that other families were going through and they really wanted to contribute to ease that pain. So they not only made these photographs but then they went around and they delivered the photographs and also they took photographs of these families so then to send them to the camp and to send news to the to the prisoners about their families. So there was an interaction going on for quite a long time and to me that is very interesting. This was the funny part I was mentioning, the monkey actually is, has a name and the name of the monkey is Saiku, who was later shot down because he started attacking people. So, but for a while apparently he was the, the pet of the camp and the, the prisoners of the camp. Uh, and again, I think is absolutely extraordinary the fact that they have this. And why have I given you this small souvenir of the, the image of my grandfather because when actually two years ago I decided to open this Pandora's box where all these images were stored I found about 800 negatives contact sheets and what you have in your hands is actually a replica of one of these contact sheets that I found and the interesting or the first images that I looked when I opened that box were these images and this is my great-grandmother posing flowers in each of the graves of the prisoners who died in the camp. And they, a lot of the family members did not know their loved ones had died, and this was proof, uh, this was evidence. So it was very premeditated, and the photographs, if you look through them, they're like posed in almost a performance, which I find very interesting. Uh, but at the same time, and I have been part of the, one, the work I've been doing here is reading the letters between my great grandfather and his son, so my grandfather, and just like crossing references, stories, and knowing what had happened to these families when they, they found out. So it's actually very moving the fact that these images, which were later, and a lot of times I, I've, I've been asked the questions like, how is it possible that they were allowed to make these pictures? In 1940s Portugal, photography didn't play a huge role in terms of like propaganda or counter propaganda or even resistance. So my guess is they didn't figure it out until these images actually started showing up in the resistance of Portugal to show the crimes that the, the regime, the fascist regime, was actually perpetrating against its own citizens. So I've been thinking a lot about how me as a photographer, how, what can I do in order to show this not only as an archive project but also as an idea of how history is still playing in our current days. And part of what I've been doing is this, so just going back to the places, trying to study the individual image and understanding what's in there and try to show that image as of today, but also interpreting my own vision of what Cape Verde is. So also part of those 800 negatives that were not only made in the camp, but also in their travels, uh, the people they have met, the re different things they have seen in Cape Verde during these two trips, and also p photographs of Portugal, of the families of daily life in Portugal, that they would send over to the camp while they were receiving mail so they can have news and visual news from, from this.
and uh, the other part that I've actually been doing is, and this is the second phase or what I call the second phase of the camp, is in 1961, the so-called colonial war, the way we call it in Portugal, or the independence wars that Angola, Mozambique and Guinea-Bissau started against colonial Portugal, uh, made that the, the government of Portugal decided to reopen this camp, change its name, so it was no longer a panel colony as it used to be, it was now a work camp and they change it from Tarrafal, which is the name of the village, to Chambon, which is the name of the closest village on the other side. So Tarrafal is towards east and Chambon is towards west. And so they just switched the names as so people would forget what Tarrafal used to be. And now Chambon was reopened in the exact same place, exact, exactly the same thing. And people from Angola first, and this is Luandino Vieira, who's a very famous writer in Angola, and who actually best work was written while he was in the camp. He was 12 years of political prisoners, eight of them in Tarrafal. And I have actually, I just returned from Cape Verde a few weeks ago, and I've been interviewing and photographing former Cape Verdean political prisoners who are still alive, and I'm planning to do so still in Angola and in Guinea-Bissau. So I've been photographing a number of people, recording their stories in order to actually tell the, the whole history of the camp, not only the Portuguese part of the camp, but the colonial aspect of, of the camp as well, and how conditions were different, how the stories were different, and how the times were different. So obviously in the 60s and 70s, no photographs were allowed in the camp. So there is not one known photograph taken in or close to the camp uh, during those times, not even official photographs, which is I find interesting, but I'm still digging to see if there's something going on. Uh, but so again, these are, for example, this gentleman, Luis Fonseca, became a very prominent figure of Cape Verdean diplomacy uh, as of, Two years ago, I think he's retired. This gentleman here became a policeman. So very different people went through that camp with very different outcomes. So I'm interested in that. What, what is of people's lives after the fact, after this experience, after torture, after being incarcerated for years? Uh, and Divo Macedo became a policeman, which is interesting. After independence, he went to police academy and he became a, a policeman. But also part of what I have seen in that archive and then I started branching out to different archives in Portugal and in Cape Verde uh, was to understand what was behind this camp photographs, what, wh what story was being told there. And I realized that th what happened with my great-grandparents in these photographs that I have made is they actually did a portrait of colonial Cape Verde. So here in this image, for example, if you look, you will see two white boys, one holding very fearlessly his football, and all the rest are people that are obviously not white. Some of them are naked, none of them are wearing shoes. So this is, to me, a portrait of what Portuguese colonialism looked like. And it's very hard to find this, or images that show you this, extreme poverty in the former colonies. So actually, as I've started seeing some of these images, I started to decide that I wanted to do a portrait of Cape Verde that is now an independent, stable democracy. And I have been going back and forth through some of these images and to some of these ideas to show what was the before and after. This is actually my great-grandmother in the lighthouse of the city of Praia which is one of the oldest lighthouses in Cape Verde, if not the oldest. And this is still today, you know, it's still there, still standing, people are still going there, still a landmark. Uh, and I'm fascinated by that. The way if some things have radically changed, some things have definitely not changed. And there can be visually very vivid. So this, for example, is in the island of Sal, which in Portuguese means salt, for an obvious reason. This was a huge salt mine that is still a huge salt mine. So salt does not have the relevance today as used to have obviously in the middle of the 20th century, but it's interesting to see how the landscape somehow it's pretty much still intact in that sense. And 
the, the really interesting part of reading all these letters is to understand the logistics of how these travels happened. And I, the beginning I showed you a, a picture of an airplane with my great-grandparents, but actually that, their airplane went from Porto to Lisbon. For them to arrive to Cape Verde, they would have to take a boat. Then actually one of them was heading to Guinea-Bissau and they jumped out first. On their second trip, they managed to take an airplane to this island of Sal and then to rent a sailboat and sail to the island of Santiago to be present at the 29th birthday of my grandfather, which was June 11, 1950. So to me, it was very interesting to understand this whole logistics. So in my own trips to Cape Verde, I have decided to, to sort of like try to see how things are in terms of how can you move around, how's the economy, how are people living, how's the landscape of Cape Verde, which is a very interesting place because Verde in Portuguese means green. Theoretically, when the Portuguese first arrived, it was all green, but the landscape is pretty much always dark, very dark, very brown. It's volcanic. It barely ever rains, but when it does rain, it actually becomes green. So in August, it rained for the first time in four years and four or five days later, the whole island started becoming green. So it was really fascinating because I'm used to this like very dark brown, no color. I asked Luandino, the, the Angolan writer, what was the color of Tarrafal? And he looked at me like, no, Tarrafal must be photographed in black and white. There is no color. There's always this palette of things. There's no color. And I kept thinking about that. And it's like, yeah, the water makes a difference. So whenever it rains, it really flourishes. And I wanted to document that. And this is the very hard reality of Cape Verde. This is a group of women and two men extracting sand from the water because there is no sand on the beach anymore for construction. So a, f a truck full, fully loaded with sand, that does very heavy lifting work to do, costs 50 euro. So that a full truck might take you a week to fill. So there are six here working. So that gives them about eight euro each for a week's worth of work. So these are the very basic things that, as you know a little bit of the history of Cape Verde, I don't know if you do, two thirds of the population of Cape Verde live overseas because living conditions there are quite hard. And that's also a big part of it, shipping back to Cape Verde, whatever you can, to your family, to your friends, to build your dream house there. And so what happens is a lot of those shipping containers that come full, they just remain there because it's too expensive to send them empty anywhere. So you see these type of landscapes oftentimes, which I find fascinating uh, and sad. And this is a way I was traveling and a lot of people do travel between the islands, which is by boat. An airplane takes 10, 15, 20 minutes to go from one island to the other. To us, it took us 26 hours to go from Sal to San Vicente, which was what I was trying to go. It's part of life, you know, like time has a different meaning. You, you cannot be trying to push things forward. So you sort of adapt and you understand how life is and you just go with, with it. But then there are, and as I said, I tried to do this post-colonial comparison and on your left, you have the governor's house in 1949. And today you have the president's house, which is the same house. The, the flags have changed, but it's pretty much the same place, which to me is fascinating. The resignification of these places is actually something that I'm very interested in. Same here. This was a fountain with my great grandmother. Uh, on the right is Lilika, who's the daughter of the, the family that welcomed my grandparents in Tarrafal and her aunt. And she was studying in the only high school that was in Cape Verde which was in a different island from Tarrafal, from, from Santiago. So she had, she, if she wanted to study, she had to go to a different island, live there for three years to study, and she did with her aunt. So I went back to it uh, and sort of like started looking for these pictures, same as the, the governor's palace, now without the Portuguese fear on top of it, and there back in '49 with the Portuguese fear. So it's only the little things that I'm like trying to look while creating this portrait of a larger Cape Verdean identity of the history of the camp in itself, but also of 
how is it to live in a very small country influenced by West? Not so much as I would have imagined by Africa, a lot by Brazil as well, because a lot of the culture comes and backs from Brazil. Uh, so to me, it's all of these small details are interesting with the Chinese new colonialism all around Africa. And that is also very vivid in, in Cape Verde. Uh, and this like very strange moon-like landscapes of this is a house from someone who probably lives in the United States and he's just building his dream house in Tarrafal. Uh, but until from the beginning to the end, it can be many, many years as things just keep evolving. So the landscape is oftentimes, you can see this weirdness going on all the time. So to me, the basic question has always been, how do you, first of all, what do I do with this whole story? Do I only focus on the camp, on the repression, on the fascist regime, or I try to open it towards a more like, a better dialogue between the present and the past, and that's what I'm trying to do. And also my role as a photographer, you know, like, okay, I'm an image maker, I'm a storyteller, but I have this enormous amount of images that I really must respect and pay homage. So I've been like thinking a lot about that and a lot about the way that we perceive images. So this is actually probably the oldest photograph that I remember from my grandfather. And this image is still today in my grandmother's house in like maybe this size, really nicely put up on the wall. And I remember this picture since I was a kid. And not until two years ago, I actually, when I opened this box and started looking at the negatives and the prints, uh, I started seeing the original photograph, uh, which is square because this is a, a crop version of it. But I also understood where that picture came from. And this is actually an image of my dad, great grandmother in 1952 when she passed away because of a cancer. And because my grandfather was in prison, he could not be present at the wake and the funerals. So my great grandfather had this picture made and here he is, is present. And the idea of a photograph being a representation of someone is actually very strong. And to me, it's very interesting the times we're living with, that we all have a camera in our phones. Uh, we all use cameras pretty much every day, but we, how do we archive them? How do we store, how do we print? We are not doing any of that. So maybe if we would be talking in 2050 about something that had happened in 2020, this work would not be possible because this is only possible because my great grandfather very organizedly put these negatives, these contact sheets, these prints, super, super organized. And fortunately, the family didn't discard it or didn't throw it away. It was just kept by my mother. Uh, and understanding the, not only the, import, the historical importance of it, but also the materiality of it. So to me, this example is actually, I finally understood that picture in my, in my grandmother's house, which is that one exact, uh, has been sitting there, but I had never seen this image before. And to me, that's a very interesting uh, approach to the power that a photograph can have. And the idea that memory and photography are so intertwined with, with each other. So I'm really, really lucky to have access to these images, to have access to these stories since I was born because my parents were never shy of explaining me my own history, my, the history of my country, the history of my family. And to me, it's been 20 years of trying to understand this history, to try to understand this country and try to like somehow open a dialogue between the past and the present, between the different stories, between the different faiths that these people had. So yeah, that was pretty much it and what I wanted to show you and I'm very happy to answer some questions. Thank you. Now I'll sit down. <laughs> No. Yeah.
so basically the the archive lived on the house that my grandfather lived until he died and my second my second great grandmother she who i met uh, she also lived there and that then that house was uh, closed for many years and when finally they decided to my basically my great aunt and my mother and her brother decided to split things my mother knew it existed and she kept it so when i started actually printing these pr these photographs i offered a print to my uncle and he looked at me and was like how do you have this uh, he didn't even know and thankfully he didn't even know what nobody did except for my mother because otherwise it would be very easy just to spread things out and to not properly store them and lose them basically yeah but yeah uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, my mother, I was already a working photographer and working with this. My mother told me, uh, well, we have a box with uh, some images. I think there are some images from Tarafa there and some negatives. It's there, it's kept. She told me where it was and I decided not to open it. I waited until I was ready to open it and until I had the resources to open and to dive into this story uh, for two years now uh, so yeah i purposely did never open the box and the, the day i did open the box the first envelope that i actually opened was my great grandmother visiting the graves so to me it was like super emotional just to open that is immediately like started crying and like wow this is history just in front of me and like okay now what do i do with this that's been like what's been in my head for the past two years. Thank you for this uh, great presentation. It's a fascinating project. Um, I'd like to know more about, or I mean, it's not a definite answer. I know it's, it's experimenting different directions, but more like how you visualize it in the space. Um, like, will you include some of the archive along, will you, how you will mix them with a contemporary picture? Uh, will you include um, the field work that you've done uh, with the inhabitants that you were able to interview as video footage or as text uh, transcribing their life or, or as photograph with maybe annotations? Um, and. Uh, like, how do you translate this material, or what are the, the different directions that you're exploring in translating this material into different narratives in the space? The, thank you, uh, Lamia. It's a lot so of questions. It's definitely a not definitive <laughs> answer. It's probably not even a proper answer because, so how, the way I imagine this final project to be is a book, and that's what I'm focusing or starting to focus now and that layout and how to properly create this and then an exhibition and as probably you as well I when I am in a project I am quite obsessed about that project so I've been collecting stuff about this for years so I have from objects to obviously the archives I, last time I was there there was one day I just started to collect seeds from a from a tree in the cemetery, which is the same tree that's inside of the camp. And because of Luandino and his writings, uh, who's, he always mentions that tree, and uh, I don't know the name of the tree in English, I'm sorry. Uh, but so the, just the idea of dirt, I've collected dirt from the camp. So I don't know yet how is it gonna be the final layout, but I am absolutely amazed to, to try to bring it all together my printing notes from the darkroom because a big part of what I've done over the last year was to go back to the darkroom to enlarge these negatives and I have kept printing notes from all of them so I have all of that I've been collecting collecting interviews and recording the interviews on video so right now I'm imagining a lot of things then we will see what reality brings in in terms of space in terms of resources to edit the video in terms of the amount of space that I have to play with things, but I definitely would like to bring part of the originals into the exhibition and then cross or and photographically speaking for me, it's very important 
so people understand the process you know like it's very different to make an image in 1949 which the print has I'm, I'm giving you an original or a facsimile of an original print which is very small and the way we now see photographs when they're hang which is usually much bigger because of technology so I'm very interested in that process as well the, how the, the photographic process has kept evolving and materializing very differently so I will definitely try to explore that as in an exhibition setting but still very much open Hello, well, um, I wanted to ask you if you have shared part of your discovery with some of the Portuguese institutions, because this is a very sensitive subject now. Uh, I'm Portuguese, I'm Isabel, <laughs> and uh, this is really, well, in university, for example, you know, as well as me, that this kind of subject, or post-colonial studies, is quite recent in Portugal. Have you ever shared with someone in the last two years? Or Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I work very closely, I'm very fortunate to work very closely with the Portuguese National Archives, Torre do Tombo. Uh, so they know what I'm doing. I've tried to open a conversation with other institutions, but it hasn't been easy because I'm not an academic. Uh, then on the cultural side, it's not easy because I'm from journalism. Because in, and then in journalism, it's very hard because there is no more journalism. So it's just like, I keep going around these circles and thankfully the Institute for Ideas and Imagination exists. But I'm actually saying this, I'm, before being here, I, I've been with a grant from Gulbenkian and from the, the Direção Geral das Artes with this project. So I've been like, I've gathered some support, but in terms of like the way this material is going to be treated, I, I have not decided and I obviously need to consult with my family. But my idea was at least a set of these prints to be in the National Archives for other people to be able to consult them, yeah. So um, you were saying that, um, are there any other collections of photos that are of this particular concentration? Type? No. None whatsoever? There are two or three official photographs wow. uh, that were made upon the construction of the camp. And then the, the same director that actually allowed my great-grandparents to go, he did have his portrait taken with all the prisoners two years before, I believe, so in nine, probably 1947. So there are those images. And recently, as in Portugal, as Isabel was saying, this is a very fresh and touchy subject. There's a new museum or a will-be museum, a uh, resistance museum in the former prison. And they actually just received the album that was created by the prisoners in the camp with this, some of these photographs as they were being sent by my great-grandparents for them to have them, they decided to do a, an album. So they actually have the letters of them asking for the materials, for the cardboard, for the cloth so they could bind it. And that album, I just re discovered it three months ago uh, in June in Portugal, uh, had, had, hasn't been lost, actually was kept for many years by the anti-fascist uh, association and it was just delivered to this museum. So they're tr still trying to figure it out and I'm trying to help them as well with it. But the only, of, the only images from this camp are basically, th this is a small part of what, that I've shown of course, but are th is this body of work. There are no... And and it's not feasible that other families would have done the same thing. No, as your it's is, it's not because there were no other visitors. Right. Uh, there were visitors from the African part, so from '61 onwards. But it was absolutely forbidden to take any photographs. So there were families from Cape Verde, from Angola, I believe, from Guinea-Bissau as well, go and visit their loved ones in the camp, but absolutely no photographs. And so you said also that you were looking at correspondences. Uh, these are correspondences between members of your family and, yeah. and just the correspondence that's inter-family correspondence. Inter-family and then I believe there are some from my great-grandfather to the other families. Mm. Uh, I haven't read them yet. It's a lot of paper. Yeah. So, so you have an idea. They, my great-grandfather and my grandfather wrote each other a letter a day for 20 months and they would send each other a telegram once a week. Mm. 
So that's roughly 900 letters plus the telegrams that I was basically for a month and a half just like reading. Fortunately, my great grandfather ones are ta it's typewritten. My grandfather is still handwritten. So I'm like going to do a joint venture with my mother to so she can read it really well and I can type it. Uh, it's part of the process, but it's this is very very long and every if you keep digging you keep finding things so it's it's the wonders of investigation right but yeah so far in terms of images I we haven't found anything else uh, and now I'm going back to these families that receive these photographs and some of them still have these photographs so I'm actually interviewing them and that side of the story as well in order to try to to give the complete picture of what it, what was this Um, thank you. That was really fascinating to kind of see a you know, personal way into such a, a large political story. I was really surprised by the photos from the cemetery. The reason, I guess I'm thinking why, and then I think it's because for me, you know, in Yugoslavia we had an island in the Adriatic that was a camp for political prisoners and dissidents. But um, because of its clandestine nature, the people who died there were either buried at sea or in are marked mass graves. And so when you see the cemetery with like carved headstones, mm -hmm. I'm just super curious, is that, would the camp have made that? Or who, who would have made those headstones? And then it seems to me that in terms of their permission to, sh to photograph that, that's kind of where they're actually photographing, you know, they're, they're, they, they're creating a record of actual deaths provoked in the camp. So I'm just curious if you could tell us more about the cemetery. So the tombstones are actually in the, it's not inside of the camp, is the municipal cemetery. So it's the group cemetery for the village. And they had a section only for the, the prisoners in Tagafal. The bodies are actually not there anymore. So they were exhumed in 1978 and brought to Portugal, but the tombstones remained. So they kept them there, as you see, in pretty bad shape. I don't know who did it, but I know Whoever did it, they did it exactly the same way. The first death was in 1937. The last one was in 1948. So those tombstones were done exactly the same way with the same materials. So it was obviously the same person. Uh, but I, know, I don't know who paid for it. Or my guess would have been the camp. It's part of their admin uh, work. Uh, but yeah, I don't have a lot of information. Nor from the archives that I've consulted, there is any information on that. I have the original budget for the camp, and tombstones were not in that budget. I can tell you. Well, following following on from Ido's question, I had the same thought. There's a there, there's a parallel history to your history, which is which I'm curious about. It's the history of the authorities allowing your great-grandparents to make the trip. It's the history of the authorities allowing the tombstones to be made. Um, uh, and that's a history that would tell you something interesting about where the camp fitted into the dictatorship's conception of its relationship to the Portuguese people, because uh, um, Yes, there are uh, 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 there are other other camp systems at the same time in other places where they would never have allowed. Of course, and they would certainly never have allowed photographs to be made, and they wouldn't have been carving the. And that, so there's that whole. Does that whole side of things is, it, it has has that occupied you at all? To yes, but also as a Portuguese person, you sort of understand this. Let me give you an example. Uh, when my great-grandmother died, so in 1952, she was very well known in Porto. Uh, she was probably one of the first feminists in Porto. When my, great -grand when my grandfather was shipped off to Tarrafal, she actually was in the port when he was entering the boat and she stood up and she made a huge speech against the regime, which was actually very interesting. And that speech is written and it's been disseminated quite widespreadly in that time. Uh, but the very interesting fact is that my great grandfather, so the gentleman who actually took those photographs, was ex the only stock exchange broker in the city of Porto. So he not only had a lot of money, but he had the whole connections. 
in order to reach out to the director of the camp and ask if he could visit. So he was actually welcomed. This to go back to the, the funeral. So I have the list of, ev he was obviously a very obsessive person. Uh, I have the list of everybody who attended the funeral. And in that same, there's probably 20 pages of names. And in the same page as the director of the concentration camp, who was in the, in the funeral paying his respects to my grandmother, maybe 20 names under it is the father of Álvaro Cunhal, who was the secretary general of the Portuguese Communist Party then, who was hiding. So Portugal is a small country where everybody knows everybody. And that also plays a fact that if you know the right people, and this was not a secret camp. Tarrafal and in the 50s was pretty well known in Portugal and outside of Portugal. And so it was not a secret story. It was just an accessible story because it was literally very far away in a poor country where people could not afford to go there. So because they could, they, they could have access and they were welcomed by the governor of Cape Verde. So they had the whole, uh, the whole open doors that allowed them to do that. Saying this is actually, the correspondence is absolutely fascinating because the food in the camp was actually terrible. So when my great-grandfather returned, he started sending food via mail. And mail would usually take about one to two months to arrive there. And suddenly, I didn't know, there were internal customs uh, in the Portuguese Empire. If you'd ship something from Lisbon to Cape Verde, it would be stopped in customs. And the first time he shipped something, he shipped fish, uh, canned fish. So someone had given him a hundred cans of fish, which he shipped to the camp. And then three days later, he shipped something more. And then the next week, he shipped something more. And the guys in customs, when they start receiving everything addressed to the same guy in the camp, and it was just a ton of food, it was food for like 40 people, permanently arriving, they, started, they decided that this, this would be contraband, so they would not allow it. So there was like two and a half month negotiation and my great grandfather had to send money to my grandfather to pay the duty fines so they could actually bring in the food. So it was very absurd in this sense of things just like played out. Uh, there's like many layers to this. So there's obviously he had the connections, then he had the willing, he had the money, and then he knew how to manage bureaucracy. So that's, I think, how it happened. But I don't have any absolute uncertainty because this hasn't been written. So I'm still like navigating and trying to understand and speaking to people who remember, who are still alive and remember some details. So I'm trying to cross check and cross check, which is a lot of work, but also a lot of fun. Were the letters censored? No, which is a fascinating thing. Because I have letters before my father, my grandfather was shipped to the camp and they were always censored and you have the censor stamp. When he returned to Peniche, which is this prison was now becoming a museum, always censorship. In the camp, there are no, there's no stamps. I don't know if they would read them or not. Previously, I know they would and they would cut chunk of it out. I don't know. I honestly don't know, but I have the original letters with me here and the, there's not one single censorship stamp. But there's also very, a very interesting way of writing, obviously, because they had been in for a while and my grandfather had been dealing with this for, uh, my great-grandfather had been dealing with this for a while. So other things that he would send to the camp, for example, were books. And he sent a book by Suero Pereira Gomes, who's a very famous communist writer that died very young. And his last book was shipped by my great grandfather to his son. And in the letter, it was a short story uh, book. And in the letter, he has obviously read the book and he sends, oh, uh, by the way, I'm sending you this book uh, by a fellow, uh, how do you say? Um, a fellow accionista, stock, uh, stock um, when you own stock from a company, you, what it, that makes you an owner of the company, right? Shareholders, shareholders thank you. <laughs> By a fellow shareholder of yours, and he speaks about you and some former business parts, partners of you. And it's like, oh, interesting. 
I went to I went to Google the book, and the, this book was published in January 1951. It was sent in February 1951. It was censored by the political police in May of 1951. So actually, the books were all taken away. I think the book arrived to the camp, but I just bought my own copy uh, on, a, on an old book's house, and I've I've read. The, it does not mention anyone in particular, but it's always that that very traditional. Uh, way of writing from the, those times and the like engaged, socially engaged stories and stuff like that, which is very interesting. So it was very interesting that how correspondence was always very short and very subversive in a very interesting way because it was not obviously subversive. Uh, then I have letters from many years later and poems that my grandfather wrote who were very subversive, but they were taken away illegally from the prisons where he was. Uh, but in this sense, it was just like very simple things that sometimes if you connect the dots, it's like, oh, this is what's referring to. And this is very interesting. As they also speaks about his joint pains because it's raining and how my grandmother or my great grandmother is now having this women's pain which was basically the cancer that was starting to show up and they didn't know so it was like very interesting uh, way of communicating and they did it so my grandfather in the end he spent close to 19 years in prison in his life and we have most of the correspondence from those years and it's interesting to read i haven't read it all of course uh, but it's interesting to read how this form of communication just evolves and he basically him and his my mother uh, they knew each other from writing. That's why she knows his handwriting so well. And so it's very interesting to see how that language evolves and like advice for a teenager girl, which was her daughter. Uh, so it's very, it's very interesting and fascinating to read. Glad there are questions. <laughs> Every time I hear you telling that story, Joe, I have the feeling that you are preparing a film and not a book of photos. <laughs> <laughs> is that, I mean, is that true or do you have that idea somewhere? Next question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I've thought about it as a film. Uh, I've actually been recording some scenes, but I'm not a, definitely not a filmmaker. I don't know what the hell am I doing. Uh, I think of this, this could be sort of like a storyboard. So when I'm done with the book, when I'm done with the exhibition, I might do something on that end. But I think it's, for now, it's all very remote in my head. So right now I'm really focused on the book and the exhibition and then I'll see. But who knows? Could I ask you about the, um, the contrast between Tarafal and is it Chambon? Is that the... Yeah. Chambon. Um, so the... The story that, you, that you're able to tell here because of the privilege that you talk about, right? The fact that you have a stockbroker who, man, who sends communist short stories to you know, a political prison camp with coded language about shareholders, et cetera, um, and manages to ship tin fish and things like that. Um, it's a very different story, at least as you can present it at the moment. Let me just do a pause there. The, my favorite shipping story yeah. is when he ships six bottles of champagne to the camp. Uh -huh because he has read that champagne is actually good for fevers and because they were all having malaria he just ships uh, first six bottles and then i think he ships another four uh -huh. and in one of the six of the weekly uh, telegrams they send each other uh, there's a very fascinating one where my grandfather replies we got the packaging uh, prisoner x is sick everything is okay, champagne unnecessary. <laughs> and I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you just mentioned the shipping and I'm like, oh right. yeah, the champagne. So I'm, and I don't know how to deal with these things. You know, like if I publish this, I think the Portuguese Communist Party will have a hitman on me, you know, right. because I'm just gonna throw a whole myth about the concentration camp down. So I'm still like processing. Well, so, I mean, that's, it, that's partly what I'm interested in here is yeah. this, like, the incredible richness and the sort of luck in a certain way, right, for you, um, that you have this kind of access to it and an archive that is so incredibly wide and rich and can be expanded.
versus a sort of non-archive of Chambon, right? And, um, and the colonial prison camp. Um, and a lack of, an, uh, both a lack of access, and if I heard you correctly, there was a kind of implication at least that um, the lessons learned from the political prisoner camp um, meant that there was no access, meant that there, was, there were no cameras, meant that you couldn't take, that there were no photographs. And so we have a non-story, right, in the 1960s and 70s mm -hmm. of, the, of, of Portuguese colonialism in the camp there. I don't know, could you talk about that a little yeah. bit more? Uh, there, the images were forbidden, but letters uh, were allowed. And actually, people like Luandino, there, was, there were several writers, most of them Angolan. Who, Agustin Neto was there? No, Agustin Neto was in Portugal. Uh, uh, Luandino was actually writing because his profession was a writer. He was allowed to have a typewriter in the camp, and he would sit under this tree, this, uh, this tree that he keeps mentioning. And he would just write, and he would write short stories, and he would write novels, and he actually won the most important uh, literary prize in Portugal at the time while he was in prison. And the, the government was so appalled by it that the whole committee of that prize was dismissed after he was given the, this, this award for his book Luanda. So as it was hard, and of course they were much more organized, the, in the 60s and 70s than in the, in the 40s and 30s. So the, the channels to bring things out were actually a lot easier. So you could write things that would be read and censored, but Luandino, for example, uh, he has this, he's a, an amazing storyteller, he's still alive. So a very important part is that you still have a lot of primary sources who are alive and can tell you their, their experiences. Uh, but all of them say their circumstances in the camp compared to what the Portuguese circumstances were, were absolutely much better. So they, would, they could speak to the guards, they could buy food outside, and in this relationship to the local community, there was one, one woman who I met and photographed, Nya Ana, and Nya Ana had a cow, and that cow would give about one and a half liters of uh, milk a day, she would have half of it for herself and her family, and she would sell the other half to Luandino. And Luandino would buy the milk and would pay her with money that her wife would send him. And one Christmas, because he was there for eight years, one Christmas he asked the director of the camp if he could give a gift to Nyana because she was very steady and she was always trying to help him. And the, the guard accepted, the, the director accepted. So he offered him two baskets filled with maize, with corn, which is part of the main diet in Cape Verde. And he, one year he did that, and he gave him the, the, the two baskets. And then the next year he asked the director, so we're talking about years of waiting. He asked the director to do the same thing, and the, the director authorized. And when he delivered the baskets to Nyana, he told him in Creole, if you find something in those baskets, please keep it. So under the, the corn, he had hidden all his papers. And when he left the camp in 1972, or 73, I'm sorry, uh, he went straight with his wife to Nyana's house, and all his papers were there. And those papers have now been published as a 1,200-page uh, book Papéis de Prisão from Londino, and this was published four or five years ago. So there is a lot of information. And if you go to Cape Verde, there are more, there's different experiences, different times that help to paint this picture. Visually speaking, they were much more aware of the power of images in the 60s and 70s, so absolutely no way you could take any photographs. I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah, I yeah, tried. I mean, it's interesting yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then. Well, we can say Vietnam happened, yeah. and the power of images yeah. just boomed with that. And obviously, the Portuguese dictatorship, there were no dumps, and they understood it. Thank, Thank you. you Thank much. you all.